Welcome, welcome, welcome to the next episode of the Step One Podcast, where we help you take your first step or your next steps in business and in life. And today's guest is an NFL star turned real estate powerhouse. So we have some rules and ask, as always, before we dive into introducing my guest, number one, knowledge without implementation is just entertainment. So make sure when you take notes from today's session, go out there and take massive levels of action. Number two, if you have any questions, please comment down below and we'll be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. And number three, most importantly, if you be, be sure to share this out with the people in your life and make sure that you quickly tap the like button and uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. So let's go right into introducing my guest. So this guy was, uh, was in the NFL for a number of years. And then after retiring and hanging up the cleats, he continued to work for his former teams, the Denver Broncos and the Atlanta Falcons as a creative media director. And then he became a leading real estate authority in Texas, really focused on the Dallas Fort Worth area. And uh, he's got clients. He's really the go-to agent for notable sports figures. And over the last 10 years, he's built up an investment company, Lamont and Son Incorporated, which was founded in 2009 with his father. Welcome to the show, my friend, Marquez Branson. What's going on? What's going on, man? Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You know, love to, you know, talk shop with like-minded individuals, man. I'm like, really excited about today, but looking forward to it since, you know, we kind of had spoken about, you know, doing this again. Yeah, absolutely. Though, thank you so much for being on the show. I really want to dive into your story. I mean, listen, you, you've accomplished a lot in your life, and uh, I want to get to know the younger you before before the NFL fame and all that kind of stuff. Like, wh who who were you as a kid? So, as a kid, man, I, I grew up in I grew up in Palmdale, California. Right, my both my parents are retired military. Air Force vets and whatnot. And, you know, I grew up, I was just a, uh, a kid that really loved skateboarding. Tony Hawk, back when that game was really popular, that's where they were, I really enjoyed, man. And, um, but when we, when I turned 10 years old, we ended up moving from California to Mississippi, right? So that's a completely different, you know, on two different opposite spectrums of the, you know, stratosphere there. Sure. So when I moved to Mississippi, my grandfather, he had, you know, basically a farm we have about 125 acres out there in Mississippi. So when I moved there, well, I turned to pretty much hard work, right? So as a 10 year old, I'm up at five o'clock in the morning picking peas and corn and, you know, in the fields and, uh, you know, making fences, tending to the cows, all kind of stuff that, you know, really, really set that foundation as far as hard work, you know, consistency, all, you know, being on time, all of those type of things. So I came from a background of parents who were in the military so you know what that comes with and then I was met with someone like my grandfather who was just a hard worker through and through. Wow so then uh you went to school in the Mississippi uh, and you know middle school high school and then went off to college where? Yeah yeah so I went to Starkville High School played football there um didn't really get recruited at a high school man I was kind of like a I wasn't you know very fast at the time I was probably about six foot you know a little undersized to be a tight end per se. I played wide receiver, but I was a little too big. I'm gonna say I was probably too slow is what it was. And so they put me on the line, but I had really great hands, right? Uh, but for me, I think that was really like a kick in the butt for me when a lot of my friends that were on the team were getting offers. They got letters on, you know, intent from the hometown college, Mississippi State. Uh, I didn't get anything, right? Uh, I didn't really get anything. Um, and then through high school, I dealt with, you know, kind of being an outsider, was kind of bullied, you know, I was, you know, like I said, I came from California, very proper, prim, you know, the way I was speaking when I got there is for the country, right? So I was just made fun of for all different types of reasons. And I think that really came to fruition after my senior, senior year in high school. And then I ended up going to a JUCO, East Mississippi Community College. If you don't know of it, you can look it up on Netflix. It's Last Chance U. I went to school there before they became the powerhouse they ended up becoming, right? And it was an experience, to be honest with you. It was a time where I really had to find myself and I really got to know the real Marquez as far as my grit, uh, my tenacity and my willingness to you know, work. Because I went there probably 200 pounds. And by the time I left, I was 240 solid. When I went there, I probably ran like a four, you know, four, nine, something like that. And when I left, I was sub four or five, right? At 240 pounds. So uh, I built myself up in JUCO and ended up going to the University of Central Arkansas where I, I kind of coupled up with my offensive coordinator that I played there with, man. We had a phenomenal quarterback and my office, my OC really saw the talent that I was bringing as far as at the tight end position. He actually gave me a chance and started, you know, 
planning game plans around and giving me the ball. And in two years there, I broke every single tight end record that they had. Um, like that's amazing. Hundreds of yards and whatnot. So, wow. So and how much, and I'm just curious, cause like, I, I really don't know the world too much, uh, you know, in, in regards to football. So I'm curious to understand like how much of it is it, just having like such a good relationship with your, your coaches in college that can really put you in the spotlight. Cause I feel like that obviously helps a lot. So the, the thing about that is it's, it's tandem, right? So that can help if you are a, you know, average player who, who is really assignment, you know, sound, right. You don't make mistakes. You don't hurt the team. You don't hurt yourself. Right. Yeah. But if you, if you don't have the talent, you're not going to play. It's just what it is. Right. right? That, that's, I mean, the cream of the crop rises to the top. So if you're, if you don't have the talent and no matter how consistent and whatnot you are, you know, how fundamentally sound you, other people will beat you out. So for me, I was just able to do both, right? I had that good relationship with my OC and then I was, I wasn't afraid of work and my talent started to shine through and it wasn't because it was just a natural talent. I think the only natural talent I had was my ability to catch the ball, right? My wasn't the greatest blocker when I first started, built that. I wasn't, you know, the fastest, built that. Wasn't the strongest, built that. And so what I added to my game is what really allowed me to catch, start catching some eyes and some scouts because the numbers that I was putting out and what I was putting on film, uh, you know, showed through and through. That's awesome. So uh, one of the big questions that I um, had when, when I was thinking about you or you were coming on, what would be something looking back if you could go back and tell your younger self, what would be one or two things maybe you give yourself advice about? Um, I don't know, you know, if, if anything at all. Man, I would look back and say, I could have spent more time in the playbook, right? Spent more time studying, being more of a student of the game. You know, when you're in college, and, um, you know, I was from a very small town in the country. I was just excited to get out of mom and dad's house and go do my own thing. So, Although I was a hard worker, I wasn't necessarily the most studious when it came to the actual ins and outs of learning the game. I understood from the yeah. foundational level, understood that I could pick things up really quickly. But if I would have took the extra time to know exactly what was going on, on the other side of the ball, especially like reading defenses, reading coverages, roles, and all that type of thing, it would have prepared me more for when I got to the league. Because when I got to the league as an undrafted free agent, that was the biggest learning curve because the system they had was – light years it's like algebra and, and uh you know uh, trigonometry or something like that it's like sure. two different two different game sets right so um it was definitely a wake-up call once i got there and i had to then start to really start understanding and reading making sure i know the plays because in the nfl is not necessarily about your your talent it's not necessarily about what you're bringing physically because everybody who's there is a good player what are you doing to give yourself the edge above the rest of the players so what are you seeing those, like the best of the best in the NFL doing differently than call it, you know, the average player in the NFL right now? Game, game tip, game film, film, tape, tape, film, all day, every day. You're in practice, you know, meetings. After practice is over, you know, you have the guys who just go home and you have the Tom Brady's who are there until probably 10 at night. And then they go home, eat, maybe get some rest. And then they'll wake up early and tape before they even come in for meetings, which is more tape. So it's tape. It's finding those little, you know, those small little things that you can see about a player, what they do per, per their tendencies, right? For the defense, what they're doing, what the safety does to this look. It's so, it's so vast. Like when people say that, you know, football players are not very intellectuals, I, I beg to differ, man, because if you saw how thick my playbook was, and if you understand the play is probably there's three plays to every one that you see run, right? Because everybody's doing different things based upon the snap of the ball, what's happening, right? Because nothing stays the same. Agreed. If you have know anything about football, when the ball is snapped, people are rolling down, that changes your route completely. You're running a completely different one. If someone blitzes, you got to be aware of all this. And it's like happening in split seconds. So. Wow. So, I mean, that, that's just really amazing. How do you feel like that translates into the real estate world or even call it business? You don't have to say specifically real estate, but how do you feel like that translate in the business world of just understanding? Like, I, I, I feel like I've heard, I've heard people say that before when it comes to, you know, rewatching gameplay, um, when it comes to, you know, top performers in, in, in uh, sports. So I'm just curious, like, where do you see that overlapping in business? Well, especially with 
our day and age with all the technological resources we now have, right? I, it plays a part because you can stay ahead of the trends, right? I think real estate for the longest time was done one way. And as we're seeing now, there's a lot of different, there's, there's different ways that are coming about that are more efficient. They're, you know, scalable, right? And so you're able to do more with less, right? That's what technology has allowed us to do is we can do more with less, right? And so understanding the trends, making sure you're, as far as the studying goes, making sure you know what is coming to your city, what is coming to your towns, understanding why people are coming, why people are leaving, all of these type of stuff is really the film study, like understanding your market, uh, understanding people's tendencies, and really using that information to better yourself as far as a real estate agent and also an investor. Because if you're an agent, you should be trying to own property yourself, right? Because you can see the power of it. And it's a big discount for you because most people have to pay us a commission, <laughs> right? And you're not having to do that. You don't have to pay, like say you sell your own property, you can do a flip. Well, you're only paying 3% as opposed to six, right? That's a big discount. And that's a big, you know, that helps your margin when you're running the numbers on a, a potential rental property, a potential flip, anything like that. So it's just really understanding the power of all these, all that tech, technology has allowed us and afforded us to do. Yeah. And starting when we have it to use. I like that a lot. So then what about um, before, because obviously I want to dive into your, your, your transition, which I know was, um, you know, into the real estate world. So I want to really quick, I, I am curious though, what do you feel like well, you learned the most or you took away the most that really prepared you from the NFL to get into, get into the business and real estate world? Is there any similarities that you feel like you picked up or, you know, things that were, you know, thankfully prepared you for that you maybe didn't realize in the meantime? Cause you know, like those are just lessons that kind of just came out later in life. So the, the, the number one thing I'll say, right. The number one thing is understanding nothing happens overnight. That is the biggest piece. And that, I think we all still, everybody still struggles with wanting, you know, we're a give it to me now type of society. Yep. Our tech, technology help doesn't help out very much because you can get anything in an instant now, right? But understanding from the standpoint of football, uh, you know, I went to UCA my first year. We did had a pretty good season. We ended up in the conference championship game the first year, and we got blown out. It was just bad. I mean, they were playing We Are the Champions with like 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter. It was not it was, it was not fun at all, right? And I knew some of the guys that was over there. I played in high school. So that really that really cut deep, to be honest with you. As a, as a player, you try to get to that level and you want to win and then to lose that bad, right? And so you did all that work, all, I mean, two-a-days, all the way from summer workouts, for 4 a.m. workouts, all the way in the evening, studying, film tape, and then to get blown out in that type of fashion. And so you have to press the reset button. You have to understand that, okay, I have to do everything that I did last year to get me here, but what are we going to do different in order to, to get over that hump, right? And that's kind of just a daily thing that you have to do, especially when it comes to business, is what you did yesterday doesn't count for today, right? You need to put in the work every day, be consistent, and make sure that no matter what you're doing, the, everything that you can do during that day to make yourself successful. So it's just understanding the, the chipping away attitude to reach that overall goal by hitting smaller goals along the way, right? Yeah, that's really powerfully said. I love that. And uh, let's talk now into your transition from the NFL world, you know, football, now into real estate. Why Why real estate? I mean, I, I, I can imagine you're probably investing a little bit in the world of real estate, but like why become a realtor? Like was that on the horizon or the game plan anyways? Or, you know? So... I've always loved real estate, man. I, I've been a big fan. I watched HGTV just, I used to watch it religiously, like when I was just younger, right? Uh, my dad has always talked about it, but he's never really just delved into it, you know, fully. He's, you know, he always said that's the best way to build wealth. That's kind of what they taught us. They always taught me to save money, which I, I mean, it didn't really give me the reason why. They just said that you should save it. So as a young man, eh, wasn't really doing that. But when I, I think I saw the power of it, because uh, I got into the league in 2009, right? So you kind of know what was going on around that time. Sure. And now, mind you, I'm a young kid. I'm still, you know, I'm spending money like crazy. I'm enjoying myself. It's my first time ever having any type of money. But I did end up buying a property in Mississippi, right? Um, I bought it cash, $24,000. I held it for a year, rented it out for $750 a month, which over there is probably $400 more than I actually could have rented for. 
but I did, a, I put probably 20,000 into it and made, you know, kind of made it look nice and rented it out for a year. And I just saw the return on it. And, you know, some years later I sold it and it was worth 50,000. And I was like, huh, I really didn't do very much. I, I mean, I, I, I managed the property myself just so I could learn, but I really didn't have any issues with my tenants. That was really a blessing. You know, a lot of people have to deal with, you know, bad tenants, you got to deal with evictions. I didn't have to deal with any of that. Yeah. And so that great experience kind of catapulted me into, oh man, real estate is like, this is a way to really, because not even counting all the cash flow that I had because it was a cash property. Now the property has appreciated to, to 50 from 20. So I was like, huh, interesting. Okay, I got you. This is, this is, I like this. So let me, let me start researching more. Started reading, you know, bigger pocket, bigger pockets, blogs, that sort of thing. Yep. Uh, you know, everybody says they read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So trying to understand finances. And that's kind of what catapulted me into the real estate space. And then from there, I started picking up, you know, traditional rentals. I had a couple under my belt, was doing that. Um, I kind of went back, like I said, I was in the corporate America space, did that marketing with uh, the Broncos and whatnot. And from that point, I was trying to figure out if that was the route I really wanted to go down. I didn't like, you know, even as a football player, you still are pretty much a W-2 employee, right? You, you can be cut at any time, right? And that's just an understanding that you have. But I didn't like that, right? I wanted to be in control of my own destiny. And so for me, coming down, I was trying to figure out how to do it in real estate. I started, you know, devil in the Airbnb space. Love that. You know, that's kind of what I've switched my portfolio over to. And I love Airbnb. And from that point, I started looking at, okay, I want to acquire more properties. How do I do this? How do I get the inside scoops? And I wanted access to the MLS. So I started dealing with that. I got my license and, you know, I just helped my, helped my so I've helped teammates get, you know, properties. I've helped other people that I know get properties. People know that I love real estate. So they come to me in that fashion. And so that's what kind of catapulted me into this. Now I'm just trying to help as many people as possible, especially with my culture, man, we don't necessarily understand the power of real estate. And that's kind of one of the, you know, driving factors I want. I want my people to understand how powerful of a tool and wealth building tool real estate actually is. Yeah, I love that so much. And uh, it's, uh, it's interesting how like, I feel like a lot of us or a lot of realtors start off as investors, right? And uh, then they kind of just get into the world as an agent. I mean, it's a very different business. It's an incredibly different business. Completely. Yes. And uh, I just find it always fascinating because even now, like when I'm coaching people on buying their first investment properties, they're like, should I get my real estate license? I was like, you don't have to. Like everyone just thinks that's just part of the process to do it. And, it, you know, you kind of think about it as like a weird way to, you know, invest in real estate, like, you know, but, uh, you know, let's talk about now as an agent, how things are, you know, your first year, let's, let's talk about if you could redo everything after your first year. Cause I know like, you know, just like me, my first six months was, or my first year sucked. Right, we were kind of joking on a previous uh, a previous content of like how the, the first year has been treating you, which you know you've been doing great. Um, what would you have done differently restarting, knowing what you know now? I'm always curious to get some feedback. I, knowing what I know now, I would have hit the phones harder. So, spoiler alert, <laughs> I uh, I got my license in at the end of August of twenty, I believe it's twenty twenty. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. In the August 2020, I started cold calling in, at the beginning of May, right? Of this year? No, no, no. Last year. Okay. Cool. No. Okay. So I started cold calling before I got my license, right? I was, I was, I was delving into it. I wanted to make sure that I understood that because it's so efficient, and I'm always about efficiency. Running Airbnb properties, you have to understand. You make them profitable by being efficient, right? You yeah. have a good cleaning crew. They come in, they do their thing. You're not you're not losing money on, on you know stupid things. So sure. for me, my first six months, well, yeah, I'll say from May to probably end of October, I was calling, but I wasn't really calling. Maybe two hundred thousand a day, you know, one hundred and fifty dollars a day, right? I, I, mean, I, I didn't even count contacts back then because I didn't even know anything about it. But when I'll say by the middle of November came, I hit the phones, right? I think I made, I made 10,000 calls in December. I made 10,000 calls in January. 
went up to 10 in February. Like I really started to understand the power of what I was doing. And I think it comes to the point that I was actually still learning how to cold call. And so for myself, I would have tried to sped up that, you know, learning process by making more calls at the very beginning, as right. opposed to, you know, just doing, you know, it was pretty much the bare minimum the way I see it. So. Yeah. And it's interesting that you're doing that. So I want to dive into exactly what, what, what you mean by cold calling, because I love cold calling. It's a huge thing that, and I preach it nonstop because I think that it's like, there's nothing better, nothing faster to jumpstart your career as a broker um, than just hitting the phones. I mean, like you can't, you know, it's funny because you read as much as you want, but until you're actually on the phones and practicing and, you know, for real, you, you don't really know. So let's talk about who, like, what kind of lead lists are you calling, number one? So for me, my main source of leads is going to be circle prospecting. I absolutely love it. And for, like I said, being a realtor is kind of something that it's just a career that I decided, you know what, this is what I'll do. I'm, I'm already doing real estate. So let me do this as well. So I think for some other realtors who necessarily don't have, you know, investment properties, they don't have the, that sort of stuff, multiple streams already going on. You know, you get into the business and you're really, I need some now business. I need now. Now is what I need. I need to see what's going on. So they use, they call expires. They call FISBOs. They're trying to go through that route. I didn't necessarily have that sense of urgency with that, right? Yeah. I have multiple streams. So it's like, okay, well, let's think about this from the long term. And I asked myself, what do you want out of business? Okay. I don't, I'm going to tell everybody, I don't really like cold calling. It's not something that I would love to do every day, you know, but I do it because I understand the power of it. And I understand having discipline is what's important. Yes. Um, so from that standpoint, the type of business I want is an attraction business where people are now calling me, right? That doesn't happen when you first get started. That takes years to build, right? And so for me, it was about, okay, how many people can I talk to a day, introduce myself, let them know what I do, and let them know I'm here to help them, right? And how do I stay in front of them? Those are the things that really made the most sense to me. And so for when I'm cold calling, I'm not necessarily calling to get a deal right now. I'm calling to build that relationship, start that relationship. And, and then I stay in front of them with my weekly email um, or on Facebook ads to my entire database. And like I said, I was getting, I think when I was calling, I was doing 10 to 20 emails a day, right? So I've been able to build that database in a year to about 1600 people. So my goal is to get that to 10, you know, about 10,000. And if I can do 1% a year, from an attraction standpoint, and now we're talking about 100 deals a year without me having to actively, you know, pursue as far as uh, prospecting goes. So yeah. that's the type of business that I want for myself, and right. it's really attainable if you put the work in on, up front. Yeah, no, I agree 100. percent Yeah. So listen, if you're an agent listening right now, you know, really in your in the beginning parts of your career, and you have not jumped into the cold calling world yet. Listen, like it's an essential piece of it. Like I'm not, you know, we're not, you know, not saying that that's where a hundred percent of your business for the rest of your life should come from. But you, if you, you know, you got to build that database. You got to build a foundation for your business. And there's nothing better than just hopping on the phones and cold calling. I mean, like, you know, it, it's, and listen, like I truly believe, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, mastering the art of communication and especially through cold calling, like through cold calling is really how it, it, it helped me in, in the future. I mean, like there's really nothing better than getting really punched in the mouth on a daily basis to really understand communication at a deep level. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we say something in football. Everybody has a plan until you get punched in the mouth, right? And then that's when the plan goes out the window. And that's when you start to learn, especially when you're doing the cold calls on a daily basis, you you start to you start to have the same conversation over and over again but there's different ways to go about having that conversation right, right. you start to notice people's tendencies or how somebody's reacting to you if they're in a bad mood in a good mood and you know how to then smooth that over you know how to you know what words to use and say and it also helps you you know become a little witty or come back the comebacks are a little more fluent and so like you said cold calling is not about cold calling people and property owners and trying to get them by ourselves. Cold calling is about becoming a better communicator. And once you understand that, now when you go on a listing appointment, you don't really have those jitters or worries about, you know, exactly. <laughs> about what you're going to say when you're having a conversation, because you've been, if you can be, if you can build rapport with someone over the phone that you've never seen or talk, spoken to before, then doing it in person is like, it's almost like easy street, to be honest with you. Absolutely. It becomes a cakewalk. I love that. Yeah. And it really, it really does teach you how to be fast on your toes when it comes to, uh, to sales. So I think that's really powerful. I mean, listen, that's how I started my career. 
you know, very, very similar. So uh, real quick for the realtors that are listening, what software are you using? So for myself, man, I have a couple of different ones I use. Um, for my calls, uh, for my dialer, I like Redix. I've been using them for the longest time and I used to use their data as well. Um, when I first got started, you know, for, every, for me, it's always about, you know, I always want to keep the lowest overhead for whatever I'm doing and be effective, right? So I was using Red X, using their data. Um, after a year, I started to hear, I mean, I've heard about Vulcan 7 a lot, you know, as far as, you know, the data they provide. They're just a little more expensive. But now that I'm, you know, pretty efficient at cold calling, I switched over to Vulcan from the data standpoint. I don't like their dialer. Their dialer isn't up to par. You can't really see. It doesn't have the features that I like about it, like yeah. recording your calls, which I can do on, on Red X. That was something that I did as well. I would literally do call sessions and I would record all my contacts, go back, play them back, write down, you know, the objection, write three rebuttals. And that's how I, that's how I was able to start. Okay, well, I heard this before. This. Yeah, absolutely. Again, that that's the piece of it. Do you have that in, in your arsenal? And yeah. so... Now what I'm using is Red X for the dialer system and I use Vulcan 7 data. It's amazing to be honest with you <laughs> because cool. whenever I call somebody, it is who I'm trying to speak to, which is usually property owners. And I'm building rapport with property owners who in the future are gonna sell and wanna buy. So each deal is gonna be two deals potentially. You know, I'm trying to have 75, 80% of my deals doing that, right? Um, and yeah. then from the standpoint of my weekly email, I use a, a software called Flowdesk. Okay. It's basically like constant contact, same thing, you know, you know, track all my emails and whatnot, I'm sending to my database. And and then I use, do you use any apps as far as for your numbers and whatnot to change them up for, you know, you get, uh, when you get ping spam likely and all that type of stuff? Um, I, I do not actually. I mean, I use, uh, the only software that I really use is my CRM Brevity. I use Mojo mm -hmm. Dialer and um, I'm trying to think if I use anything else really on a daily basis. No, it's really it. So yeah, so at a time, like I said, especially during you know the fourth quarter, I usually ramp up my calls. I try to, you know, some months I'll just set a goal to hit 10,000 calls. And so when you start doing that type of volume, I have a triple line dialer, yep. your numbers will get linked to spam. And so when I first started, I was using my number and then I, I noticed a, a big drop in my contact rate and that was the issue, right? And then when I was going to follow up with my, you know, warm leads, nurture leads, hot leads, I noticed nobody was picking the phone up. So then I had to do the whole call transparency thing, make sure I got my number linked. But I said, hey, let's learn from this situation. Let's not do this again because if the amount of calls you're making, you're probably going to get, you know, uh, P yeah. and spam. What I think has worked best for me in regards to that, and uh, I'd love to get your two cents on it, is that my goal is that the, I want to get into a text communication with every lead as fast as possible. So that way it doesn't mm -hmm. pick me up as spam next time I call them. So like any lead that I get, yeah, any lead that I get, I'll immediately send them a text and uh, from my personal cell phone. And uh, mm -hmm. that way going forward, at least it's a familiar number. Right. Yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't really do the text very much. I haven't jumped into that. I've seen the text thing, but again, for me, I just use a couple of, I use a couple of apps. I was using the burner app, yep. which will, you know, you can get switch out your three numbers every month or so. But because I call so heavy every day, I needed something that I could change daily. So now I use an app called Text Free, right? And I'm able to just at the beginning of the, the beginning of the day, I just switch my number out and we're calling with that number for that day. Um, I also use Zapier, right? So yeah. um, I have a couple of automations. So wherever I input a new you know, person into my Google Sheets, that sends it to my flow desk, which then sends the welcome email. It also sends a text message to them with a picture of my business card. So that's all automated every time a new person goes into the database. Cool. Um, and then I have, I use HubSpot. So just a little free CRM, but that's what I use to anybody. I tend to, with people who say they're like a year out, I don't, I don't do a bunch of follow-up with that. I may call them every six months, but anybody who says they're six months out, I just divide that by, you know, three usually. So if they're six months out, I'm going to follow up with them every two months, yeah. right? If they're three months out, I'm going to follow up with them every month they're a month out, you know, weekly, that's kind of how I have it set up. And so I have, I probably have 50 people who have told me they're going to probably do something this 2022. And anybody else who's maybe thinking about it, who just didn't necessarily want to show their hand, or well, they're getting that weekly email, that brand is being built on a weekly basis. So they're getting touched 52 times, my plus whatever, you know, the CRM calls for 
per their situation. Sure. So. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, listen, I mean, for those, those of you who are listening right now, I mean, this is some gold. I mean, like it's really getting super organized around your leads and listen, like, you know, the, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of other aspects. This is specifically just around the cold calling and just basically from cold lead to consistent follow-up. And this is a really powerful systematic way of doing it. So I think that's really powerful for people to take away. Let's flip on to the, the, the investing side. Cause I know you and I chat about that a lot. Tell me, tell me about the, uh, the investments you have right now. And then I want to dive into sort of like, what's, you know, what was your best investment so that people can learn from it. And I want to dive into the numbers. Okay. So yeah. So investment side, I have five traditional rentals there in Mississippi that I own, you know, free and clear. Those are just, you know, cash flow, and it's just, they do what they do. Um, from the Airbnb space, I have four of those running. I have two in downtown Dallas, one in Mississippi, and I have another one in Plano. I'm also working on, me and my dad, we just, we've had these blueprints for a duplex that we're going to probably end up building in Mississippi as well. So cool. those are the investments that I really have as far as the real estate goes. Okay, great. Now let's talk about your best investment yet. What was like the best, like, I want to know the numbers on that deal. My best investment from which standpoint, like a rental example, or just a, a the, it doesn't matter if it's Airbnb rental flip or anything, just the one that you feel like was the best investment you ever made in real estate. Okay. So I saw an opportunity. There was a, a DR Horton home, a new community being built that's probably three miles from AT&T stadium. I bought this back in 2017. Right. Um, they were way undervalued. I don't know what they were thinking when they, I mean, they just must've had some margins out the wazoo. It was a four bedroom, two bathroom. It was about 17, 1800 square feet, brand new community. And I bought that for 175,000, right? I immediately put that on Airbnb. I was making $7,000 a month, right? Wow. Uh, so, okay, just I, to clear on real quick. So this is in Mississippi? No, 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 this is in, this is in Texas. So, okay, where in Texas was this one? This was in Fort Worth, Texas. Fort Worth, Texas, bought in 2017. You bought a brand new construction home for 175,000. Cool, 174 four beds, two bath. I went in there, I probably put $10,000 into it after it was fixed just because it was an express home, which okay. is basically, you know, spec home, um, wood floors, some can lights, new fixtures and whatnot. Uh, had my photographer come out, take photos, put it, on the, put it on the site, I was booked in an hour, right? So- Okay, I so now- really that, now that property, how often is it rented right now? So I sold that property and I'm oh. going to get to that. So I, I had that one in 2017 and everything was great. You know, this is, I, this is when I was fairly new with the Airbnb space. So it was, everything was going great, making good money. I knew the area was going to be popping. I started getting into some situations with my neighbors, though, right? And this is where I think a lot of people don't talk about this from the Airbnb standpoint, right? Like you got to understand that you can't control the people at your house, right? You can do your best to put some checks and balances in, noisy wear, uh, if nobody knows that is, like a little device you put in the house. It uh, tracks the decibels or how loud stuff is, so you, it alerts you, lets you know if somebody's having a party. You can have your ring cameras, all the above, it doesn't matter. You can't control everything. And so I started running the issues because guests would, you know, be loud late at night, my neighbors didn't like it. I was in an HOA, which frown, again, these are all rookie mistakes. Don't get Airbnbs and HOAs, just don't do it, right? And so I was, I had my way around that because the HOA didn't have the language in their, in their bylaws that I couldn't do it, right? You know, it was okay. They'd have to change the bylaws and we'd have to vote on that. So I was like, oh, well, we'll be fine. I just have to deal with these neighbors. Well, the next thing the neighbors did, they went to the city of Fort Worth. And from what I didn't understand is that Fort Worth had a, age old ordinance that says you can't do short term rentals. Now I had no idea about that. Right. Wow. So I'm rolling along with my Airbnb doing great. And then I started getting visits from the local ordinance man. And then I got hit with a fine, had to go pay that. And then it was, it started to become really, you know, nuisance. And this is probably around the 2019 area. I was still doing it for a while, but it just got on my nerves, like dealing with them. Now, mind you, I could have just took it as an operational cost and dealt with it because I was making enough money to cover it. But I just didn't want to be, you know, I didn't want to be outside of the law like that. So I ended up selling that property in 2019. I sold it. I wish I, now looking at it, I should have just turned it into a regular rental. <laughs> but uh, I sold it and I may, I think I sold it for 265, right? So for those two years, you know, $7,000 a month, my mortgage was like 
seventeen hundred dollars a month. <laughs> right. Amazing. So that that by far was the best deal. Looking back on it now, I probably just I would just turn that house into a regular rental and just kept kept it pushing because now I think it's worth three fifty. So. Yeah, it's interesting how I feel like the more people I talk to in the investing world, their biggest um, I guess regrets are just selling property. Selling property. You I know, think it's I think it's Grant. There's a Grant. There's Grant Cardone who says just buy it and never sell or something. Who is that? That's one of the one of those guys. I forget who it is. But they're like, hey, huh. the biggest biggest mistake you can do is just selling property. Yeah, I know. It's it's honestly insane. I mean, so then question for you. Um, you know, staying staying with the the investment world here. Um, first off, I want to ask, where do you see the market going over the next twelve to twenty four months? Because obviously, I know you're in Texas. So it's a little bit different. Than yeah. Market. So I, I'm going to only speak to this Dallas, this Texas market, right? Yeah. So the market here for us is going to be strong. It's just, it's, I can't see it going, you know, it may slow up a little bit. Maybe we don't have 10 offers. We might have three per, per house, maybe just a regular, maybe just one. You know what I mean? Sure. As long as you want to take it, as long as it's a good offer. But as far as Texas goes, there's just too much activity coming this way. There's too many people leaving some of these, you know, more restrictive states with everything they have going on, right? Yeah. I think Texas, especially Dallas, is on the precipice of real, real booming. Because there's just, from the standpoint of all the corporate 500 companies moving here, Tesla moved to Austin. I mean, it's just so much that's coming this way. And I think they have, we're in the works right now to build a bullet train from Houston to Dallas that'll get you, because usually the drive from Houston to Dallas is probably three and a half hours, yeah. right? It'll take you 90 minutes to get here on wow. the train. It's already, everything's approved. They're just, they're, I think they're still waiting for some eminent domain to go ahead and get that, you know, the land and whatnot to do it, but they're going to do it. They want to do it. So it's going to happen. We got two these deep pockets in this. So incredible. And then they also have plans for, we have a what's called the Trinity River Belt, which is down there in, in Dallas as well. They have plans to make, to build a park 50 times the size of Central Park in New York. So there, there's just so much that they have going on in the works. So over the next 20 years here in Dallas, I really think it's gonna become a Mecca, right? Because it's centrally located within the United States. So as wow. far as the market goes, it's going to be strong here. We may have some stagnation. I see that, you know, maybe past next year uh, where things just kind of stay the same for a period of time because the inflation has been so quick, so fast. Sure. But Dallas-Fort Worth is definitely going to be on the map for a long period of time. Yeah, I think that's very well said. I mean, listen, to, you know, unless there's some crazy black swan event, I mean, I can't imagine, you know, uh, anything really taking any sort of nosedive. You know, it's just, I feel like, you know, it, it had to be a serious, it has to be like, oh, think about it. I feel like the pandemic was a black swan event and we still had, <laughs> I know, 80% of all the same closing. So, no. I mean, I, I just, I feel like the, you know, the, you know, COVID definitely, uh, I feel like it just completely paused the market for a long, just enough period of time that, build that, that just built up the demand. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I feel like, you know, it's pretty similar here in New Jersey, you know, market wise, I definitely, you know, I can't see anything going anywhere too fast you know i think we're going to see a pretty strong market for the years to come um now let's let's talk about some of these investments you have because i'm definitely curious to get some thoughts because i know you're you're are, you're absolutely crushing it in the airbnb space and i know we were chatting about that before i am curious if you're talking to a brand new investor who wants to get into the world of investing because uh, i know you own both what uh what are some two you know maybe some quick tips that you can give them you know maybe two or three pieces of advice about getting into the airbnb space Airbnb space. So the great thing about the Airbnb space is, you, I mean, the margins are just so much better, right? So sure. what I would say is you need to really understand what people want and where people are going, right? Because I think location has a lot to do with it, right? Sure. And it's also about how many other, you know, rentals are necessary in that market. So speaking to people who may be in a smaller market, which I invest in as well, because Starkville, Mississippi is a college town really tiny right but there's not that many people who do airbnb there the people that own the property are old money right so up to techno with technology they're not really worried with that they they've been owning all the rentals for you know 50 60 70 years so it's not you know uh, a situation but for the people who are coming in who are 
feeling that demand because there's a lot of demand as a SEC school. So there's a lot of games going on. I would say just know that, look at the competition and you always wanna be better than pretty much everybody else, right? So that means professional photos, you know what I mean? A lot of people skimp on the photos. It's, it's I, I really couldn't understand. That's your first presentation to a potential guest, right? So you wanna have, I literally, I flew my guy from Texas to Mississippi to take my photos of my, of my Airbnb there because he's that good, right? And yeah, the whole thing, I, I flew him out. I had to pay for the photo shoot. I mean, the whole thing cost me like $700 to get photos, but it's that serious, right? Sure. And I'm also, you also want to do something to make yours stand out. So on the side of our house there, I had a mural painted of, you know, we have a mural in Mississippi State, uh, some nice things to do in the town, but it has that Instagrammable factor. And then when I have people come, you know, we offer raffles, free night stay, if you tag us on this, you know what I mean? So it's it's definitely like those certain type of things. And then secondly, you want to have your cleaning crew. That's after the photos, that's probably, I, I, it's hard to say which one is one or two, but you need to have a good, reliable cleaning crew who is going to come in, be on time, get it done and get out. Though those two things right there, well, you know, make up for a lot of other, you know, short changes that you have with it. And then lastly, you want to make sure that you buy or, or some people are doing arbitrage. You want to make sure that your property is somewhere where you're going to go, where you can guarantee the longevity of it, right? That's what I learned from that rental in Fort Worth. I didn't do any checks and balances. I just, hey, okay, Airbnb, let me try it, right? I didn't think about all this other stuff where, okay, I had one guest who was, I guess they were drunk one night. You know, they were trying to get into the house. They went to the next door neighbor's house, knocking on the door, thinking it's the Airbnb. It's, it's like stuff like that. It's, it's uncontrollable. I, I, who does that, right? You know, like, bro, you don't remember what the house, the house next door was a two-story. This one was a one-story. Why are you at these people's door? <laughs> but once that happens, now you have an ongoing situation because your neighbors are like, nah, we ain't feeling this. And then they start actively trying to shut you down. Sure. So now... If I do do Airbnbs and like in Dallas, I have, I have one in what we call West Dallas. West Dallas is a gentrifying area, right? So the, the property I have over there, nice three-story townhouse, you know, really, really luxury, everything, but it's basically in a pocket and everything around it is, you know, still up and coming, but it's very, it feels really safe when you get there because they've built apartment building complexes, a couple other townhome communities, but Again, in Dallas, there's no ordinances. There's nothing like that. And nobody around that area is too impressed about whether or not people are coming in and out of the house. So. Cool. No, I think that's super powerful. And then uh, when you're, uh, now when you're talking to a client um, or even actually even for yourself, are you pushing the idea if they want to get into the investing world that it makes more sense to just look into it as an Airbnb or do you run numbers as a annual rental property first and then see what makes more sense or? You know, I usually do it from the traditional route for most people, especially if they're newer to the investing realm. I only really have that conversation with people who are kind of, you know, who are seasoned investors because then it takes, because to run an Airbnb, you automatically become a business owner. That's really your first real, you know, you know, touch of actual business because it's a, you know, from an Airbnb standpoint, I'm a little more in depth than most, but I have, you know, apps that are running my pricing strategy that are adjusting prices based upon the demand that's going on in the area, right? It's automatic. It does it on its own. I also have an app called Smart b and which basically sends out all my messages. It schedules my cleaners once, a, once something is booked. It all integrates with Airbnb and speaks. So everything is pretty much automated and I just have to deal with one-offs. But, you know, knowing the numbers, seeing what's, you know, what needs to be done, um, guest relations, right? You got to know how to be able to talk to people. Again, communication comes up and understand that. I think uh, this is something I had. I had. A, I was talking to my dad about today. My mom, you know, she's looking at an Airbnb because sometimes some guests get a great deal, right? You know what I mean? They get a great deal in the property. It's a four bedroom. They might get it for hundred dollars a night. She feels like it should be hundred and fifty and up, no matter what. And I'm like, well, we're booked on Sunday. We're booked. Uh, Wednesday through Saturday, those two days there, you have a very small probability of them getting booked. But in order for us to maximize revenue, you need to be booked. We need to be booked 30 days out the, out the week. 
I mean, out the, out the month, right? Yeah. So the important thing is to get these days booked because at the end of the month, if we get those, you know, we have multiple days where they're kind of sandwiched in between other bookings and we don't book those, well, that could be, that could add up to be 10 days, but that's a big chunk of revenue. And that's honestly where your profit comes from. Sure. So lowering prices, like some people might get a deal, some people pay more, but it all evens out at the end of the month, as long as you're hitting your numbers, right? Yep. So that's another piece of it that I think a lot of people don't take into consideration. I love that. I think that's really, really important. And listen, for those of you watching, and listen, it's, it's definitely a powerful way to make great money in, uh, in investing in real estate is focusing specifically on Airbnbs. You know, Marquez is, is doing really well, but again, it is like starting a business. You know, it's a completely different world. It's, it's very not passive, you know, and uh, it's, yeah. it's a great opportunity, but it's definitely something that, you know, you just need to be prepared for what you're getting involved in. All right. So I have uh, one last thing I want to really dive into here um, for you before we jump over to the closeout. So number one, is, and I try to ask oh, I know a couple of these questions for every single person who's on the podcast. If today was your last day and you only had this very moment right now to give advice to your kids, your future kids, your family, your future family, what kind of advice would you be giving them? Stay out of debt. Don't buy depreciating assets, cars. Don't get caught up in this, in this thing, man. If I could talk to my, myself when I was first starting in the league, man what I had saved myself. I should have been investing every dollar I had in real estate at that point. 2009, no, I was buying a BMW 750 Mercedes. You know, I love cars. I do, I love them. But that is probably the worst thing that you can do to yourself financially. It's just retarded. And I know with the culture that we have, it's really, you know, you wanna look good, you know, I get it. But until you have the assets to pay for it, you don't need to be doing that. So if you can, you know, save yourself that four or $500 car payment with inflation right now, the car pay, four or $500 car payment turns into 600 when you add gas. Now we're talking about insurance. So you got a thousand, you're driving a thousand dollars a month, right? It, it adds up really quickly. And that money can be used to purchase assets that can then pay for when you have, when you want a liability, right? And so understanding that part of it and then understanding taxes. How do you save yourself money? Everybody wants to go make money. My question is, how do you keep what you make? Once you learn that, then it, it, it becomes a new ball game when you start making more, right? So those two things I would say would be the most influential, I would tell my younger self and anyone who's you know new to investing now. I would rewatch that over and over and over again for anyone listening. I mean, that's super powerful advice for everyone here. All right. So uh, before we wrap up, I will, you know, how do people find out who you are, follow you, get connected with you? Absolutely. Follow me. Uh, go to Instagram, Marquez L. Branson. On um, YouTube, my YouTube channel, Marquez Branson. Um, like I said, on the YouTube channel, I'm, I'm doing a lot of stuff as far as the real estate side goes as well. But I have made a point in 2022, I'll be doing a lot more, you know, from the investing, investing standpoint. Um, you know, we had some conversations about some insider tips that I know I have that a lot of people don't even think of, that I think will be really, you know, beneficial to a lot of people, especially from the Airbnb space. So I'm going to be sharing all of that. So if you guys will go and follow the channel, uh, subscribe, and uh, we'll definitely be seeing you later. Awesome. Well, listen, thank you so much for listening to the, uh, this episode of the Step One Podcast. We hope this episode gave you the ideas, the motivation, and the strategies you need to take your first step or your next step in business and in life. And thank you so much, everyone, for watching. Go out there and crush it.